I'm gonna use Muse sitting by the ocean here listening to real beauty not simulated and I just ate a really really big meal of rice and Indian sauce I'm feeling so hungry lately and I think it's partly the blood donation but I'm gonna sit here and muse so talk later so I need to add something to the lifestyle design creativity I've been working on this morning which is visiting farmers markets I got this really great bok choy to add to my rice and Indian sauce and I got a vegan oat bar and I got a non-vegan brownie and some fudge because there's fudge everywhere here and I also got some bee pollen so these are some fun things I got at the farmers market oh and I got some bug soap which I'm going to save for next time I go to California I checked with them and they said that it lasts in terms of its effectiveness. So yeah, these are some of my scores. Love farmers markets. I didn't know there were lizards here. Poor little guy. It was supposed to be raining all day today, and it's not, so I did succeed in changing the weather ever so slightly. So I'm able to enjoy outside a little bit. And I picked a bunch of hair off the bathroom floor from blow drying and straightening my hair, which is a within the last couple hundred year activity or less and I'm going to take that hair and put it in the ocean to have some of my material here or give that material back it's not mine All the matter in our body changes so I'm gonna put it in the ocean and when I was when that was arising in mind to do that and since I've been thinking a little bit about nature mysticism which could be a little bit related to shamanism I was pondering how one can create one's own nature mysticism so I don't need to necessarily go to shaman school to learn this but learn by doing something and making these kind of gestures towards nature to have a relationship so being related to nature by putting something of one's body in the ocean and it's a very small gesture but it's a gesture nonetheless and taking this the time to do that taking a moment to do that and give something back there's a big spider and yeah so I'm gonna do that and then talk more about other stuff so this ball of hair was created by modern ways of being of blow drying and straightening hair and then taking that and putting it back to the ocean some protein, some DNA, and living a, leaving a part of my essence here, energy. And that way I feel like I can still communicate with this ocean a bit better. It's still connected in a way. My DNA is a receiver and transmitter and creator of information and energy flow. And now it's going to go into the flow of the ocean. Create a flow and create a flotion 
the ocean can speak to me and it's a gesture of creating a relationship with the ocean and with this beautiful place. And of course, I don't know what kind of ripple effect that's going to have. I might end up choking some fish. As soon as I did that, the sun poked out from the clouds. As soon as I did that, it got brighter. And then I just realized I rubbed some ocean water in my hair without even thinking, and then that sort of de-straighten my hair in a way, but I gave some of my hair to the ocean and the ocean water is now in my hair. It's like the ocean, by me touching it, that water moved my hand and ran it onto my hair. It wasn't something that thinking created, but the relationship and the gesture towards the ocean then created this. And it's so simple and maybe not that interesting to most, but I find it fascinating. And in that way, it's a type of Gaia gesturetics. So by interacting with nature and Gaia and the water on my hand then creates a new movement in my hand that wouldn't have otherwise happened. And maybe I would have touched my hair anyway, but the ocean water wouldn't be in my hair and messing it up. So this is my office for the day. Pretty nice. It's more than nice, it's beautiful. And I'm not gonna talk too long on video because of the whole Wi-Fi thing. But I do wanna talk about something that relates to what I said about putting my ball of hair in the ocean and maybe choking some fish. Because yesterday night I went out for a walk and I felt like, oh, I'll just be out for a walk down to the ocean and back. And I was taking some pictures of the flowers and things. And then I noticed this poor little bumblebee who got rained on. And he was still alive, so I wanted to try and save him. And we shared some really beautiful time and I was taking video and I'll share some of that here and then I'll share a longer one. And this little guy got caught in the downpour. He's just still alive though. Come on, buddy. Come on. You're okay. Sit on this pit. You okay?
I probably spent about two hours with this bumblebee. And I was trying to warm him up with my breath. And I had the sense that if he didn't get home that day, he wasn't going to make it. And I felt like he needed some heat. So I eventually I took him to my room and warmed him up. And he started responding. He started licking his little stinger thing. And then he started to try to fly. And I heard him buzzing finally. And then he fizzled out. And I'm pretty sure I killed him. And I was really saddened. I, I couldn't really do anything else. I just sat there. Because my intention was really to help this poor bee that likely would have died had it just stayed there wet like that. And then I wanted to save him and then I got so close to saving him and then ended up harming him and since my intention was to help him I really felt awful and I felt like it was so close. It was so close to him making it and I thought I would warm him up and then he'd be able to fly and then he'd fly away but I think I warmed him up too much because he started to respond so I warmed him up a little more and I don't think he needed that little more I think he got too hot in there and it felt sad because I'd spent that much time developing a relationship with this bee and trying to help him and then I killed him And I felt like it could relate to how, in a way, after tapering onto micronutrients and off medications, I want to help people do the same, and that's my intention. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to make it. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to have the same, not the same, but a similar success. And... It also reminds me of how practitioners in the mental health system are very well intentioned and they they give medications and then they give more and then they give more and they're helping and things are going fine and the person looks like they're doing okay and all of a sudden the very same person is dead. And then we feel like, well, what happened? So in my relationship with the bee, had I not intervened, it probably would have died. But then I intervened and it died anyway. So learning that one can have the best intentions, but it doesn't guarantee anything. There is no guaranteed outcome of anything. And it's also, too, we humans can think that we know what's best. I could have let the bee rest in my room overnight and not heated it up a little bit. I could have just left the bee outside and maybe it would have been okay tomorrow and flown away. But I thought, well, it's going to rain today. Now it's not raining, but I thought it was going to pour rain. So even if he did recover overnight, he wouldn't be able to get back to his hive. So I was trying to think of these different scenarios and then I thought, well, if I just warm him up a little and then you fly away back to his nest tonight and everything will be good. And it didn't happen that way. And I just felt horrified that I killed this little thing that I was trying so delicately and gently to help. And after all of that, effort and building a relationship and being there sharing that time and energy it died and and I was the cause of that so I feel like in whatever I do next in reaching out to people I might be inviting people into a certain paradigm and not everybody's gonna make it not everybody's gonna make it either way
does it's not it's not guaranteed that I'll make it. And what is it? So that whole occurrence felt like something meaningful to the whole of life. And it was beautiful to capture the beauty of the bee. And then I felt like, am I exploiting this bee? Am I videotaping the bee to enjoy its beauty? And now I want it to fly away now and get back home. And was I being with the bee to to record it? Was I being with it to be with it? I'm really grateful for what it allowed me to learn and shared with me in the lesson of the delicacy of life. Can we really help anything? We as human beings want things to be efficient, so I warmed the bee up to be more efficient and he definitely responded just like we want to intervene by speeding things up with all these scientific things that are about usage and efficiency and you know, getting back to work and I wanted to get this bee back to work so I added more heat besides the natural heat of the day and nature and it was becoming night and getting colder so I tried but it, it died and I killed it And then I think, well, had I just warmed him up a little and not added that extra warmth because I thought, oh, he's doing well, so I'll add more. That's what we think, too. Even with psychopharmaceuticals, we think, oh, we need to add more. We need to change it. We need to do this. We don't just add a little bit and then take it away and let the person recover. We want to maintain it on the meds or maintain it on the heat or, oh, the bee responded to heat, let's give it some more heat. Anyway, enough about that little bee. I've continued to be ravenously hungry and I ate two avocados. And I feel like they cleansed my palate a little bit because I ate a blackberry from a blackberry bush and it tasted so good. So yeah, developing my own nature mysticism, my own relationship with nature. And I think looking into the eye of the bee for so long communicates something to the bees just like how we ship them into the almond fields and then they all die and we just use them to pollinate the almonds and then they all just die and we're killing them and I feel like a person trying to save one bee for two hours. One bee for two hours instead of killing billions and millions or whatever of bees in two hours. It has some kind of healing effect. The universe calculates and records that gesture. Maybe nature and Gaia will decide that we deserve to be on this planet. And I've been thinking about the magical backpack and when I was in the shower I thought about how we can either carry this invisible psychological baggage of the past or we can carry magical co-creative baggage or a magical backpack in actuality and have that as a tool of actual gestures towards 
actual people in the moment. So it's something actual in the moment. And it's fun and playful, whereas usually we wait to meet up with our friends and talk about our abstractual illusion of a self, ego, past, baggage. Whereas this magical backpack is meeting strangers in the moment and interacting based on something actual like giving out a chocolate or being helpful in some way. And that's creating something actual. And moving the other out of that space of a thousand thoughts on repeat in one's head. And one can either have a thousand thoughts repeating in one's head with all that noise, or one can be silent and wait for the universe to whisper maybe one or two things. So the magical backpack can create playful presence and give out presence with one's presence playfully. And it's really a tool to wander with love and reaching out and reaching out as a gesture. And I was also thinking about how minerals are frequencies of light and how by taking minerals, one has the right frequencies of light within oneself to give the proper light nutrition for the light shining out of one's eyes and lighting up the world and being able to see. So in a way, it could correct vision. Because thought and ego in the past distorts our vision and that's something that we struggle with at times, especially in so-called psychosis. It's like being caught in a thought storm and having the eyes and vision clouded by thoughts of the past, not just of oneself, but of the whole collective humanity. And in that way, we're learning that we are the world. We are the total humanity. We're not separate from it. And we see our place in all of it. And so perhaps micronutrients can be a type of vision correction. And when we have our vision corrected, we don't continue to wear the glasses. And this morning I was creating some of my business ideas. I sort of have them all in one scribbly place. It's a mess. And yeah, who knows what's gonna happen. And that's all for today's video and a bit of yesterday. And peace out. This is my driver's seat. I'm having an insight from listening to myself talk about the bee. And I don't know if it's true, but it feels like it's a delicate balance to know when to let the universe and nature take over and Gaia take over. Because we naturally try to help each other, but at some point, one has to figure stuff out on one's own. And I had that experience where I was learning with an enlightened master and then he kind of disappeared and I had the sense of, okay, well now I have to figure it out on my own. And that's part of why I never thought all of this was a mental illness. I thought it was, wow, I really have to figure out this energy and this huge immensity on my own now. Even somebody telling me how to do it or what's it, what it's all about isn't the same as directly meeting it. So with the bee, I gave it a little bit too much help. And that destroyed the bee. Whereas had I warmed it up a little and let it go outside, it might have not made it home, but the rest was up to the bee to fly. I can't make the bee fly.
and even if one doesn't help and overload someone energetically aka heating up the bee too much the universe can overload us too so we're not separate from that if it's meant to be that one will learn and move with the universe and surf the universe one will and if it's not it's not and there's a seal I saw him in my peripheral vision. I think it was a sea lion. I don't know if I caught him on video or not, but... Life comes to meet you. I think I'm talking about the possibility of being seen as someone who knows something and I'm really learning each moment and I don't know anything. There he is, way over there now. And I was also thinking about how some people in life were so synchronized with it's obvious like this one lady who I took a picture of a friend of mine she didn't see me at this event and I sent it to her to be like hey I'm here how's it going I know you're busy you can't talk right now and then the person in the chair was somebody that I'd met before and so I feel like well we're synchronized and then a few people I've met over the years and Wondering too if this is more about synchronizing with a few people rather than trying to help many. I don't know. Whatever. And the person I'm referring to who I was studying with for a while in some of his online talks said, if you can survive it, There's no guarantee of surviving, meeting actuality. It's tremendously intense and vital and powerful. Another thing that the bee taught me was how much I do love and care about these little creatures and life as much as I can because I felt deeply saddened that it died for the rest of the evening and still felt it this morning and in a way it's a gift to feel that depth that sensitivity towards a living being so that was a gift to feel that and know that It's not a concept, it's an actuality. And that cloud looks kind of like a heart. So nature is teaching me some valuable lessons. I can pull a little being out of the water and lay him out to dry, but Gaia and nature has to do the drying and the little being has to jump away. The little being has to do that part. The little being has to jump again, even though last time he jumped, he jumped right into a big pool of an abyss. And I also noticed after playing on the cliffs that everything smelt more alive. And so by being sensitive to nature, all my senses are heightened.
It's interesting how hanging out on these cliffs, I had the urge to climb down there and around the corner, and I did. And I climbed down around the other way, too. And I felt like it'd be fun to climb across there. I didn't do that. It's funny trying with those rocks. Makes me want to play on them. And that looks so beautiful down there. And then as I play on the rocks, the sun shines brighter. This is eternity. Moving, living. I thought I saw you jump into the pool. All right, round two. I tried to help your bee friend yesterday and I just killed him. Maybe. I think you're gonna be okay to try off because the sun is shining. I'm gonna put a little marker where you were and come back to see how you are later. You guys jump with total abandon. Such vulnerability to where you land. All right, the rock is a marker, and I'll come back and see how you are later. I'm just gonna let nature do its work. I have a second chance here. It's an hour later, so and he's still here. Wonder if he's alive. I just saved this guy and I think he's alive. You made it out of the pool. Ding, ding, ding. I just saw the pool water move, and then I looked, and indeed, grasshoppers are in. This is a big one. Go that way. Silly thing. Maybe I'll just move you on. Be fine. The universe is being so kind as to allow me to save two grasshoppers 
One didn't make it, and the bee yesterday didn't make it. Hello, Mr. Hop. It's my last walk of my trip to the island and feeling like I have a lot to talk about with myself when I get back home and I have so much to do and also realizing that having my feet, my bare feet on this rock that in touchness is infinitely more powerful than anything I could say. And at the same time, all that I've said with myself has co created me being right here, right now, with my feet on this rock. As I see the meaning of that, the importance, the significance, the sensitivity. And even when I'm at home, I do retreat to the forest quite often. It's something I need almost on a daily basis to acknowledge that I'm part of nature. I am nature too. And I feel like as I've connected even more with nature here. Connecting with nature opens up more capacity to be able to connect with nature. So the brain becomes more and more sensitive to the infinite eternal beauty. And as that sensitivity increases by connection with nature, then the pleasure circuits, the dopamine circuits, the needing to move according to one's own projections of what one thinks will give the next jolt of pleasure decreases because that state of looking for the next pleasure is seeking, seeking what we're projecting from the past as an assumption of what is going to give a shot of pleasure. So it's really we're addicted to our own projections and then we can't see the simple beauty and not that there's no place for the movement of pleasure at all but it loses its addictive quality and then it just fades into the infinite richness of everything else and it's not overemphasized so it's not overemphasized as using that part of the brain as most important and this morning I clicked on a link in an email I got from Lead Wise, which is an organization put on by Ricardo Semler, and he has that really interesting leadership style that is cool, and I couldn't remember his name until I saw it on that email. But the one I clicked on was a talk by a neuroscientist, Tara something, and she was saying that when people in jobs are not happy and worried and not satisfied, then the blood is diverted to the emotional part of the brain. I think she said it's the amygdala. So even though one's at work, one's not being productive. And it's the same sort of thing when we're out in the world, when our, all our blood supply in our brain is diverted towards what our personal little pleasure seeking apparatus, then it's a very limited part of the brain and we're desensitized to everything else but that which we are conditioned to feel would give us some happiness, which is, it's all marketing, it's all conditioning. We've been conditioned to want this and want that and do this and do that and get a shot of dopamine in our brain like Pavlov's dog. And I talked a lot about that with myself and I think that was the first clip where I heard a neuroscientist say, 
pretty much that the blood supply goes into the me circuits and the poor me and all this and then of course we're not being productive if productivity is something important I feel there's a different state altogether which isn't lack of productivity versus productivity but a sensitivity and a creativity Maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it was interesting because I've been reading some Krishnamurti and he also is saying that our brains are used very partially and that goes along with what is being said by the neuroscientists of blood going into a very partial part of the brain. And I think it's partial also when it goes into the pleasure circuits all the time. and then that part of the brain grows and is overemphasized. And then we lose our neurofluidity and we're neuroplastic. We're plastically, mechanically carrying out, moving according to our projections. And the other part of the post was saying how the executive functions of the human brain, which are the ones that are going to be difficult to computerize, are the ones that we need to move into because pretty much everything else is going to be computerized. So if people's brains have the capacity that can be taken over by the computer, it will be taken over by the computer. So we need to ensure that we keep up with the capacities that can't be mechanized. Can a computer appreciate nature and beauty And then one might say, well, what does that matter? Well, with more and more human beings on the planet, we need to ensure that everyone can be fed with food and blah, blah, blah. But anyways, I feel like when we go into map consciousness, a lot of that which cannot be computerized is awakened. The spontaneity of living joyfully and... The neuroscientist said something about the executive functions in the brain are the ones we have to cultivate, like complex problem solving. And I think there's a different way to look at that too. Moving creatively solves problems without having to think I'm solving problems. But we're so conditioned to solve problems that we think of it as complex problem solving. When so many of the complex problems have been created by the same level of thinking that we're using to try to solve those problems and that's not going to do it. And then they said another executive function is emotional regulation. There's a place for emotions but to have so much of our life ruled by them is a waste of energy. So emotional regulation, when we see the insignificance of it all, a lot of that energy would be reduced in usage as it would fall away as it's kind of like a vestigial function. No longer really that necessary because our personal emotions are related to our personal pleasures and our personal drives and personal drives doesn't have, don't have much to do with creativity which is what heals and solves problems by virtue of being creative without having to think I'm healing and I'm solving problems. So there's still a higher level of functioning than the ones they're talking about in these executive levels of functioning because from the level of thought and thinking that we have now, we're seeing those as the highest levels, but can we see higher levels from the level of thinking that we're at now? No, not necessarily. But then people can say, well, there's flow states and all of that, which is something beyond executive functioning, possibly. And then people are trying to get into flow. Anyways, I listened to a webinar by Jamie Wheel on adaptive leadership. And it was really good and really fascinating because what he's talking about 
is exactly what I've been talking about with myself this whole time. But in a different context. He's talking to people who are leaders of organizations or families. And he was saying that, or asking, how many people have had peak experiences? And most people had. And the whole point of it was, if somebody's had a peak experience, how do you bring that back to one's organization? And this is what I'm saying exactly with Harvest One's mania. Mania is a peak experience. And how do we look at that and bring that back to our neurotribe, to our people, to our fellow beings? That's what I'm saying. He was saying some of us have more resources or he's talking to leaders and companies. Maybe they have more money so they go on better vacations and get better um, professional development and things like that. And he's saying, so how does one take that? Because not everyone has the same resources and utilize that to help others that are not able to access the same resources to help them level up and so he's saying exactly what I'm saying I've gotten to a certain place and who knows where that is and how do I share something that might help people like me in my neuro tribe my fellow beings that are suffering and this has nothing to do with business or company but just humanity how do I share something that might help people level up if they want and he made that really good point and that was the point I was making to myself exactly yesterday and then I watched the webinar and the webinar also mentioned rock climbing and I had just looked at rocks and been like wow I wonder if I want to rock climb so it was strange and interesting that way I do think what they're doing with flow resonates with me they just haven't extrapolated it to people who access different resources in the human mind and brain and being through these peak states that are non-volitional that are so powerful that they blow out the whole ego functioning structure and then one looks like afterwards they have some kind of mental illness when it's a complete reboot. That type of peak experience, it wipes everything away. We can get it back and a lot faster. It's not like we have to relearn to walk, relearn to use the bathroom, but we do have to relearn to do a lot of these contrived things that are part of our conditioning that if people are still conditioned, like the medical system, they think that losing that is a part of some illness, as if that, all of that invisible curriculum, all that stuff were conditioned, all of that unwritten rules of society that maybe Temple Grandin might talk about, all of that gets wiped away and we have to relearn it. But when we relearn it, it becomes something we're aware of, but it's not all of life. We're not so immersed in it that we see it as so important. If we did see it as so important and necessary, and if it was important and necessary, we would get back to that really quickly and easily. But the thing is, we're awakened to so much more that's meaningful, significant, important, and necessary. But there isn't that structure in life. There isn't that. And this is a thing that he brought up, and this was an aha moment for me. Was that he brought up this idea of scaffolding. And he brought it up in the example of how this man, he was dyslexic and things, and he did poorly on standardized tests and then he developed the exact same test but I think what it was that they people could put their responses in a mind map type answer versus linear paper and the people who did poorly on IQ tests did 40% better on the same test just different scaffolding is what Jamie Wheel said and as I said this was an epiphany and an aha for me because I was thinking well what is the scaffolding 
for people like me. And the scaffolding is life style design. So take a person after some kind of transformational crisis called mental illness, and it's called mental illness. Well, before that person was functioning in life, and all of a sudden they're not functioning in that particular design of life, like say, nine to five job, habit, routine, living the living situation that one had. So if one is trying to get that back, one is likely gonna do 25 to 40% worse. So one needs a new scaffolding. So a new way to live life because map consciousness invited us to a different way of living life, a totally different way of living, perception and action in the moment, which is flow. Yet all of our lives are designed for habit and we're trying to get people to recover back into habit and routine. So I feel like the same person who's seemingly non-functional, which is the equivalent of doing poorly on an IQ test and said not to be intelligent, not to be functional, having a different scaffolding could do 25 to 40% better. So what I'm saying is in this course thing I want to design, that is key, is this different scaffolding. Because we're not necessarily going to be given more financial resources. I haven't really had more financial resources than other people in my position. I have managed to work a little bit here and there and I'm lucky that I had good credit so I was able to get a line of credit and sometimes go into debt up to five thousand dollars. I think one time close to seven thousand so I can continue to live my lifestyle. It's not exuberant but being able to drive my little car and I'll be right back. One of the main things that put me more into debt was my hospitalization in April 2016 because I was really careful about working and getting overloaded after that. And then I stopped eating healthy, but I still went into debt because life is expensive. Right now I think I'm about even, so that's good and I will get the iPhone because I want to record this new course on the new iPhone. So yeah, the scaffolding thing and I want to talk more about what he talked about in the webinar because he is saying the exact same thing in that one hour webinar that I've been saying in these 200 hours of video. And I've been living that and I've been living in beauty and everything. And it would be nice to not live in financial poverty and I don't think that that's necessary forever. But more importantly is sharing a scaffolding that might help people like me live a different kind of life because that map conscious state is inviting us into that so it's important to move into that which we were invited into and the recovery movement is inviting us back into the monotony and routine and drudgery of life and not saying there's no place for some of that but if we can move towards something else for ourselves and see what happens. It's an experiment, it's not a guarantee. And I really do feel that moving towards one's dreams and designing and creating that as we go and living it, little bit by little bit, or big bit, whatever we design, is what tells our being that we're living and that state of map consciousness we felt we're really living and even if we're not in that state of map consciousness anymore 
can we design stretches of our life at least closer to our dreams than to the drudgery of recovery. We don't want to recover over our dreams continually and I'm seeing that by living segments of my dream in my life that made other dreams possible because as we live creatively, as we live according to our design and our dreams, that other stuff falls away. It's not necessary when we're fully living our life. Of course the mind is going to freak out and create all these abstract thoughts and tune into the craziness of the collective human unconscious if we're living in a room. We're not moving. We're static. We're this static antenna picking up any kind of crap. But when we're moving with the infinity of life and to the fullest expression of our human life at any given moment, that stuff can't accumulate on us. It can't touch us. Our brain is tuned into an immense infinity and little thoughts can't even reach us. And I don't know if this is true for sure, I'm just saying it. So I don't want to say that Jamie Wheel and the Flow people are my inspiration because these are all things that I've come to myself. They've come to it by the way they're living and by how they've taught thousands of million and billion dollar executives. Well, my people are people like me. It's not about making millions and billions of dollars, but it's definitely about richness. It's about the richness of living and inviting people to design and live life as a rich scaffolding. And I've talked to myself about creating a web of context to crowd out the memes and the stories of the mental health system. And that is the first scaffolding. That is the first part of this design, which doesn't take money. It doesn't take money to sit and talk to oneself and really consider and harvest some of these experiences and ways of being and states of consciousness and consider what else it could be besides the story. And when we believe and adopt that story, we then move in a life of that story. The psychiatrist appointments, the hospitalizations, the med changes, the this rehab, the that rehab, the this clinician, appointment with this person, appointment with that person. When we start to design a dream, so there's the web of context, but then design one dream and live it for a day and see how much gets healed, which could be living as one's manic self for a day, going out and being spontaneous, moving according to what one sees in the day, giving something out, talking to random people, designing that way of living for one day. And that's why the magical backpack is an integral part of that. Or whatever one designs. And I haven't experimented with the magical backpack yet. I have to some extent because I do have stuff in my bag that I carry with me. But I want to make it more fun and incorporate fun and silly gestures. And if I do incorporate a business, it's to incorporate fun and silliness and craziness and this kind of life and say it's okay to live in this much joy. And others don't feel it, but if we start to gesture in that way, it invites the joy back. And I haven't fully done that yet. And it's because it's not time. If it was time for that, I would have done it, but I haven't. I feel like the micronutrients will help me gesture in that joy. And I feel like I have undertaken this serious research project of my life to 
come to this point of taking micronutrients instead of the meds and now for me it's about well can one live sensitively to nature and when around humans live really joyfully and share that joy and I'm not there yet because I'm not able to say ha I'm on micronutrients not meds and look at life look at this movement of life so yeah that's exciting and yeah I want to talk about the micronutrient paper when I get home talk about some other stuff I discovered here and that was a part of the thing that Jamie Wheel said that I don't think I went into. I said, that's exactly what I was talking about yesterday, and then he was talking about it. Which was, this isn't right for everybody. And it's not about making someone change or saying someone should change. It's an invitation. It's a creation. It's not... saying people have to change and I don't think I have that perspective at all in these dialogues with myself because I really don't know this moment now is perfect and there'll be moments in the future that are different and perfect in their own way so there's no ultimate it there is no ultimate moment there's no ultimate experience the ultimate is in the freedom to move beyond habits and beyond routines to be sensitive to the whole infinity and to allow the beauty of the world to open up the entire brain to allow blood to flow to the entire brain not only to the parts that we're projecting that we're seeking or that we want or that we desire and then we're missing out on the totality it's not that we want a particular thing more we're aware that we're not moving freely so can we erase that which would prevent this free movement and the free movement is the movement of perception if we're only projecting we're not perceiving and then we're moving according to our projections and we're in a prison of our own brain cells the projections in our brain cells are our prison and this morning I did some bug saving from the pool there's a grasshopper stranded on a leaf and I rescued a couple of those guys and I pulled this poor little guy out of the pool. I'll bury him. He might be able to get you now. I got you.
So I'm at the ferry terminal now waiting and I reserved this ferry, but I probably would have made the earlier ferry had I not stopped for fudge. But the fudge was worth it, it was really good. So I'm sitting here and thinking that now is as good a time as any to extrapolate. And I was looking through some notes that I made and I realized there was something else significant about finding the neuroscientists talking about how when we're in that emotional state, the blood is being diverted to that part of the brain. So we can't think cooperatively and creatively and all that jazz. And they were referring to it in terms of work. And I realized that I wrote down something about how I noticed when this man was speaking that when he spoke, the big artery in his neck puffed up. So it was like the blood wasn't flowing, it was stopped, so the artery actually blew up. So I was thinking that when we talk, the blood isn't flowing up to our brain. I don't know if that was really an artery or a vein, so I might say it backwards, but it seemed to me that the movement of the jaw stops the blood. So then there's this static blood in the brain. And then when we speak, those vibrations are going through our brain cells and the brain cells are actually creating the vibrations for us to be able to speak. So it's one process. But then whatever waste products that are created by saying that go into the blood and those waste products even temporarily bathe the brain. So what I'm saying is this speaking is somewhat mirrored in the physiological processes and I didn't really know how that worked and I don't but I wrote it down how it has something to do with when we're speaking it's stopping the flow of blood, which isn't a bad thing. But what I'm saying is, why do we choose to say what we say? And why do we say what we say? And it's like, each time we say something, there are waste products going into our bloodstream. And we're bathing ourselves in the vibrations of what we're saying, which have correlates of biomolecules waste products of metabolism going into our brain in those areas of the brain that are being used to speak what we're speaking. So what I'm saying too is if we're in that emotional space or amygdala is being bathed in blood, the emotional area of the brain is producing certain metabolites which are then going into our blood and back to our heart and circulating around our whole body. So whatever brain state we're in, all those signals get sent through the whole body and they get sent through the whole body through the nervous system too. But what I'm saying is, even if we're in a conscious state where we're maybe in our executive functioning, we're still using only a very partial area of our brain. We're using our past circuits, our self circuits, our me circuits. Why are we even saying these things? Why are we speaking in terms of like and dislike? Why are we regurgitating stuff from our memory in order to share? Why aren't we seeing something in the moment now? And the seeing in the moment now vibrates our brain cells, which then nourishes our whole body and we can act accordingly. So I don't know if that makes any sense. It was interesting to think about it, how when we speak, it's keeping that blood in our brain temporarily or changing our brain circulation. And what we're speaking as or about is sending blood to that area of the brain. So I could speak about me and my sad story, or I could speak about the beauty in the moment, and that's gonna nourish different areas of the brain. I'm seeing something else. I'm either seeing my past and speaking as it, or I'm seeing something beautiful in this moment now and speaking as that, and that would, in my mind, 
increase blood flow to the now circuits of the brain. And so if we speak about possibilities, then perhaps that puts blood into the possibility circuits of the brain. And as we're speaking those possibilities, we're bathing the brain and our being and our body in the resonance of speaking in possibilities in our own voice. And I was thinking about on the drive how speaking to oneself out loud in these possible ways and the ways of possibility for one hour a day or half an hour a day or however long is way more powerful than chattering on in the brain to oneself, supposedly, all day long. And maybe speaking in this way to oneself reduces mind chatter. I don't know because I got rid of most of that a long time ago before I engaged in this process, but it could be possible because then one is speaking in possibilities, seeing in possibilities, not in possibilities, seeing possibilities, speaking possibilities, moving in that domain of possibilities and not being moved by the projections of the past as much. So when we talk, it blocks the carotid artery and the vibrations change the brain cells and the wastes of that metabolism are dumped into the blood. Not only that, as we speak and the blood flow is somewhat blocked, where does the blood get diverted in the brain? And the shunt of that, the switch of that, is what we're saying. So what I'm seeing as I'm saying this is that our voice, the vibration of our own voice, is what chooses the choice of where to direct the blood flow in the brain as we speak. I could be speaking about the past, it's going into the past circuits. I could be speaking about possibilities, it's going into the possibility circuits and bathing the brain in that way. Or I could be speaking about my emotions, so the blood's going to my emotional centers. And it's not only bathing the brain cells in that, but it's making them more congealed together, making it more into a story. And when I'm seeing and thinking in stories, I'm not seeing and meeting the moment. And the moment is life. And if we're thinking about the past, the blood's going into those brain cells where the memories are stored, those brain cells vibrate, and then start to project interference patterns as they have stored the memories holographically, and then that projects the images and sounds which overlays the moment and makes the moment now, which is new, old and about the past, which it's not. And then our discomfort is that we're living in that which is not. And we're looking for that which is, which is right in front of us, within us, through us, as us. The common word is us. We become insensitive to the moment because we're wasting our energy living in our projections. We have brain cells designed to be in touch with this moment now, but the blood is so busy flowing to the brain circuits that would project memories that we've recorded. And we record them because we feel like they'll be adequate for later recognition to help us move in life but then we move in our recognition of the past. And the universe and Gaia and the cosmos respond to gestures just as technology does. And technology has for the last hundred years maybe, but the universe has always and will always respond to our gestures. Gestures of life towards life to augment life, to augment actuality. And in learning this, as we gesture, those gestures are mirrored in our brain and send blood flow to those areas of the brain to increase our dynamic range of gestures.
So it's not just our voice that is a tool of that, but also our gestures, which are our hands, our whole body movement, and our eyes seeing. We need to see something accurately to gesture accurately towards it. So we have our body, our gesturetic apparatus, our somatic apparatus that can transmit significance through its movements. And its movements are indicative of the significance that it's moving in, which is indicative of the level of perception. So we create significance through the perception action of our somatic gesturetic apparatus. The soma is a unit of perception action and the significance of perception is informed by and on the soma and it's a cycle. And in this way we can gesture in more significance. We can create and gesture more meaningful actions. And I was on the Complete Coherence website again for the Coherence Breathing app and they have a cool mission page. They say that their mission is to upgrade our fundamental operating system. And I feel like Map Consciousness gives us the blueprint of that. But it's up to us to gesture in that significance through our somatic apparatus and change our neurology to be neurofluid. And the fluidity is partly perception. We're always perceiving something different, which changes where the blood flow goes in the brain. And we're also speaking differently. We're not speaking the same old stories over and over of the recordings of our memory and... So it's fluid. Our voice is fluid, our movements are fluid, our perception is fluid. And they said they run a crowdocracy, which is unlocking the wisdom of the people in the company. Well, I feel like this is a manic go crazy, manicocracy to unlock the wisdom of that creative space, that peak experience of mania, and bring it into our lives to share with the world. We're metabolizing the past. We're sending the blood to the brain area that is about the past. Speaking those things, thinking those things, those vibrations are reinforcing the brain cells and we continue to see the past. The anabolic process is building more brain cells about the past and the waste products that come out are about metabolizing the past. And the past is full of problems. The new knows no problems. The other thing that diverts blood flow, and this is a reciprocal process, is not seeing the moment now. So what we're paying attention to is where the blood flows in our brain. If we're paying attention to the actual moment, like an actual flower right now, then blood's going in to augment those areas of the brain. The sensitivity to nature, to beauty, to the moment now, which is beauty. The moment now is beauty. And if the blood is going into the past circuits and we're living in that, it follows that we're not seeing the moment. So we're either in those past circuits or future desire circuits or whatever, not present, which implies blindness. We're not seeing the now, so we're not seeing what is and augmenting the ability to see and be and perceive and be in touch with what is now. And one might think, well, life isn't all about looking at beautiful flowers. But the more one is with what is with nature, one can be with what is no matter what.
And then the what is acts on and through us. We're not acting or reacting based on what was. So if we can see if our eyes are looking at this moment, what's right in front of us, what's important is seeing. Let the moment create our brain. Let the moment be our brain. Seeing now is all that matters. It's what creates matter. It's what creates the matter of our brain, the gray matter. And it doesn't take time. It takes this moment now. It takes this moment now. It makes this moment now. We must create our brains to act in the now, on the now, with the now, as the now. As if now is all that matters. We must sensitize our brains to creating with the light of the now. To not pick out the pixels of the past. So I realized something important. After reading something that Krishnamurti said. And he was saying that that state of perception and action is very similar to when we perceive danger and we act. So if we see a snake, we act immediately. We don't think about it. We don't ponder about it. We don't abstract about it. We act. And this is hard to explain. This is hard to extrapolate from my brain. But I remember making up to go with fight flight or freeze or feign I think is the other one feign feign being injured I created another category which is free being free of mechanized thought and that's what happens I feel in map consciousness so in mania we're free and it feels beautiful and magical and one wouldn't necessarily attribute that space with the space of fight or flight yet it's exactly the same in that we're perceiving and acting immediately so generally our brain reserves that time of perceiving and acting immediately when it's an emergency. But that also happens in map consciousness, which is also called spiritual emergence or emergency sometimes. It's a state of deep perception action that we have access to that we also have in the peak of ecstasy. So we have it in the peak of emergency, the peak of danger, and we get a peak into it in that we move so quickly without thinking, like when we touch a stove that's hot. But this peak state, this ecstasy is the same. We touch the universe and we're immediately moved by it. It's perception action. And I never quite understood what Krishnamurti said when he was saying that it's a state like when you perceive the danger of a, a snake but at the same time it's not felt like danger the way we move in ecstasy is the same as we move in fight or flight in immediate danger it's immediate action the same the equivalent is that in that ecstatic state when we're not moving based on projecting patterns of thoughts and ideals it's perceiving and in touchness with the universe and immediate action as if we were in danger but we're not we're in direct contact just like when we look at something and there's a calculation that we need to act now we're in direct contact with it so 
how this relates is I've often talked about how we're in that space of map consciousness and we're starting to reattach or be captured by the energy of thought in the past and the patterns of the ego and the self and all the images we have about ourselves and others have about us. And since we're in this space in map consciousness of direct perception and action and in mania it feels blissful. As we're reconnecting to thought algorithms and the past and not moving in this creative way, since we're in this direct space of direct perception and action, when we're reattached to thoughts in the past, it associates that state with immediate danger. So it then projects a million stories and reasons why we should feel like we're in immediate danger. But again, it's the thought, past, projection, algorithm, mechanism coming back online and reestablishing itself. And since it's a mixed state, thought only knows that direct perception and action as I'm in immediate danger because through all of humanity, the only time we really do act like that is when we are in immediate danger. But then we're in a space of a couple weeks or a couple days or a couple months of acting directly based on perception in the moment without the thought algorithm and that equals ecstasy, that equals flow. Movement without the self, the no self state, the, sen the sense of timelessness, effortlessness, richness, beauty, selflessness, which is direct perception and action, which we usually reserve for fight or flight but it's also the same as flow. Just like there's a very fine line between pleasure and pain and pain can easily turn to pleasure and vice versa and pain can be pleasurable to some people, it's subjective. We go from personal subjectivity to radical subjectivity and it's a very fine line. And so also that space of action is as intense as if we were in extreme danger, but we're in extreme creativity, extreme flow, overflow. And I don't know if I really explained that, but it makes sense to me. And one last thing that really resonated was something I read on page 19 of Krishnamurti's book, Meeting Life. And he was talking about intelligence and how intelligence can use thought. But then he alluded to how intelligence can get captured by thought. And this resonated with me because that's how I've described this process of mania leading to so-called psychosis where we're getting recaptured by the old, by thought. Even being indoctrinated into psychiatry is being indoctrinated into a system of thought, in a way, into a way of seeing and thinking about life. So... It seems like he's saying that thought can capture this intelligence and anyone who's been in that state of so-called mania probably has a sense that there is an intelligence there. There's some kind of different algorithm that is not the one we live by in our habitual monotonous routine existence. It gets us out of routine. But then it's challenging because our society's not designed by way of operating based on intelligence, it's designed in operating based on thought. So we're moving with this intelligence temporarily, but surrounded and immersed in a sea of thought and people thinking thoughts. And we want to share how this way of being feels meaningful but we're surrounded by the old memes and thoughts 
of the design of the world. So I thought it was interesting that he said that thought can capture intelligence. So intelligence can use thought, but thought can capture intelligence. So is there a way to not be recaptured by thought? And I feel one way is self-dialogue because I've been able to create a lot of meaning and context that seems to act as a buffer to keep out thoughts. So if the most prominent psychiatrist in the world came up to me and said, hey, you've been in the psych ward five times, you were diagnosed with bipolar disorder one, you should be on these drugs, I'd say, get lost. I wouldn't take that to heart. I wouldn't buy it. It wouldn't even touch me. It's not a matter of believing it or not believing it. It's a matter of creating my own perceptions, which creates matter in my brain. Which then allows me to meet that matter in daily life and not meet the matter that I would meet if I believed and subscribed to the memes of psychiatry. That would have me meeting up with psychiatrists and clinicians. Instead, I meet the mountains and the ocean and this carrot. And I remember Dr. David Hawkins saying in one of his talks, this does not cause that. A does not cause B. But this creates the necessary preconditions for A, B, C to arise. So can our own voice and our own perceptions speak our life into possibility? Can that be the necessary preconditions to unfold a life that's meaningful as us?